The other morning I woke up and was ready to get lots of work done when I was greeted with this, the blue screen of death. I'm gonna share with you a backup strategy that works regardless of what destroys your boot drive, whether it's a bad sector, such as my case, or if it's an update that suddenly renders your computer as useful as a paperweight. Not that that would ever happen, like last week. When I heard that it was CrowdStrike, I initially assumed that it was a new kind of attack, like uh, Trojan or uh, ransomware. Um, turns out it was a cybersecurity firm. But I digress. The technique that I'm going to show you is using a free utility which you place onto a USB thumb drive and use as a live drive. So you boot into that drive and it allows you to clone parts or entire drives. And this works regardless of your operating system. So if you're Mac, Linux, or Windows, doesn't matter. You can clone your boot drive so that if your boot drive fails, you can recover it to a previous state. In my case, I had to get another drive and actually recovered it onto a new drive. I'm gonna run through how to use Clonezilla to back up a boot drive, but first let's just talk about backups in general. So when talking about backup solutions, it's kind of like security solutions where you don't wanna rely on any single one thing. Security works in multiple layers. And so you do need to have restore points. You do need to have uh, file backups as well as backups of your boot drive. And I say cloning for boot drives because for data drives, often cloning is not the best solution because you can't take advantage of uh, data versioning to save space on your backups. So for data drives, there's different solutions that you want to put into place, but this is a good uh, fail-safe backup to your backups. And with backups, always keep in mind the three, two, one rule of backups. You should have three backups. You should have at least two different formats and at least one of those in a different site located physically differently offsite from where your other backups are. And for super important things, for example, our wedding footage, uh, these are just minimums, all right? You wanna have more is better for backups, but it costs money to store files. Uh, the other thing that I would suggest as a best practice for backups is having cold storage. And that is a backup that is not on a network, uh, powered off and separate because of ransomware, lightning, and technically EMP, but that's a little deep for this conversation. So if you're not familiar with ransomware, congratulations. Uh, it's a type of attack where a malicious attacker places uh, malicious code onto your computer that encrypts all of your data and then offers to sell it back to you for normally Bitcoin because they're digital pirates. And I wonder if digital pirates get healthcare. But anyway, I'm actually familiar with a situation where a friend of mine had a backup system. It was connected to the computer and the ransomware not only encrypted his main drive, but his entire backup drive too. And he had no useful backups. On the topic of cold storage, a lot of folks look at flash drives and Flash drives have usefulness, but you need to understand their limitations as well, which is often not discussed. Fun fact to know and tell about flash drives is their actual function cannot be described through classical physics. You have to actually use quantum mechanics to explain how they truly work. But to keep it as simple as possible for the purposes of this discussion, I'll give you a very simple analogy. A flash drive uses buckets. That's where the complicated quantum mechanics of how you get charge into those buckets and we're skipping that part. It uses buckets that store charge. Those buckets are not perfect. Over time, charge can leak out of those buckets. Exactly how that occurs in a flash drive is, is actually really cool to discuss, so I suggest you look it up. But the fundamental point is those buckets each hold a tiny piece of the data. And so if the buckets lose their charge, a one becomes a zero. And if you have enough of those occur, your data gets corrupted. That occurs over long periods of time. And I'm not trying to scare you about flash drives. They are not RAM, okay? Random access memory, as soon as you remove power, data's gone, right? That is not what we're discussing. It stores it for good periods of time, but it doesn't store it infinitely. Magnetic drives also have issues where they can get bit flips over long periods of time as well. If I were putting together a time capsule to be buried in the ground for whatever the reason, the usual injunctions of keep it cool and dry are applicable, but the best storage media that 
is generally recommended is a properly rated archival DVD. The optical storage method is least impacted and has theoretically the longest shelf life. According to the Verbatim Company that makes DVDs, which incidentally is a great name for a company, unlike, uh, I don't understand why John Fluke named his precision measurement company Fluke. But I digress once again. So Verbatim claims that their archival DVDs are designed to store data up to 100 years, which as a statement from the manufacturer is a statement from the manufacturer. The biggest issue with DVD drives and storing things in DVD is you probably also need to put a DVD to USB drive in your time capsule because they are more and more falling out of favor not being placed in computers in the first place. So just a quick recap, three, two, one. Three different copies, two different types of media, and at least one off-site. And if possible, look into storing a version of your backup at least on some cadence in cold storage where it's not attached to a network where it could be vulnerable to certain types of attacks. So as for my situation, my computer was stuck in the boot loop of death and I pulled the bootable drive out because I did not have a recovery disk. You should make a Windows recovery disk if you don't have one. So I pulled my boot drive out and placed it into an adapter which adapts it to USB-C so that I could plug that into another computer and run check disk slash R on it. Uh, check disk slash R is a uh, recovery program that could take quite some time. Fun fact, no and tell, check disk slash F is a recovery format and the analogy that I've heard is it's kind of like checking the table of contents, whereas check disk slash R uses slash F and also checks every single page. So you don't need to use check disk slash F slash R, you can just use check disk slash R. So I let it run for a long period of time, it was half an hour to an hour, and it came back and said that the boot sectors were so corrupted that it couldn't do anything. In my case, luckily, I had a Clonezilla backup. Unfortunately, it was about a year old. I should have kept up a cadence of doing it regularly, and I do now. I was able to restore it, however, because of the corrupt on that drive and the fact that I no longer trusted to be my boot drive, I bought another drive. A thing to know about Clonezilla, you can go from a smaller drive to a bigger drive, but not from a bigger drive to a smaller drive. There are ways around that, but it's a really good rule of thumb and always think of using a smaller drive to a bigger drive. So if you're trying to create a, uh, a common disk image for a whole group of computers, it's best to do that on the smallest drive you can so that you can then expand that to the drives on all those other computers. They actually provide you a, with a prompt during the recovery phase if you want to make adjustments to the file table so that it will expand and fill the entire drive, which I used in this case. I went from, uh, I think it was a 256 up to a one terabyte. So I used to pull my boot drives using a Linux computer mostly a Raspberry Pi after I figured out that it was completely functional and wasn't really much slower. Um, I would pull the drives, connect them to that through an adapter, and then using the destroyer of disks, create an image. But the fantastic thing about Clonezilla is you don't have to disassemble any hardware at all, which is a good thing because there's always ways that you can damage hardware. And you simply boot into it and then copy that off to an external drive. They also incorporated the ability to live zip it as it's being pulled, as it's being imaged, it will zip it into a file so the resultant backup file is far, far smaller than whatever the drive is that you're using, unless that drive is completely stuffed to the gills, but that's pretty unusual. And even then, even if the drive is stuffed to the gills, zip can still compact the size of it using their uh, specific algorithms. On Clonezilla's website, there is great information on how to get it downloaded and burned to a USB drive based on your specific set of circumstances. So I really recommend that you check that out and read through their docs. It's really helpful and useful information. I keep a USB drive dedicated to Clonezilla where I've placed it on there and that's my boot drive for Clonezilla. You also need a target drive. I have a whole bunch of uh, cradles and adapters for different external drives, uh, but any external or USB drive that is large enough will work. And as I mentioned, you don't need nearly as much space normally as the drive that you're cloning. For example, I had a 32 gig drive, which was not a boot drive, but it compressed down to seven gigs. I had the my 250 gigabyte 
boot drive compressed down to about 100 gig. So it is normal that it gets zipped to much smaller than the actual original drive. And if you're able to in your computer architect it so that you have a separate boot drive and data drives where you put your bulk data, it makes the backup of that boot drive much smaller and much more efficient. So Clonezilla is super useful outside of just this catastrophic backup scenario. You can also use it to create disk images if you're going to create multiple computers that you want to behave identically. It's also great to create sort of like a super system restore point if you're making significant changes to your operating system or if you're switching operating systems. You can record that operating system in a certain state in case it in Carbonite and set it to the side. You can come back to it if you need to. It's far more effective than a restore point because it does so much more. It also takes up more space um, and it can be used on any operating system, Windows, Mac, Linux, doesn't matter. However, it isn't the only way to back up your data and it should only be one of your techniques and strategies for your backup plan overall. So let's go through an actual imaging of my wife's laptop. Um, Depending on how your BIOS is configured, you may need to jump into the BIOS and change the priority so that it boots off of your drive. Some BIOSes use a key that you can use during boot just for the boot priority and you don't have to go into the full BIOS menu. Um, common keys to get into the BIOS when it's booting up are F2, F12, delete, and escape. And that opens the BIOS window. On her laptop, it uses a key that allows you to select your boot drive. So I selected the USB thumb drive that Clonezilla was placed on. First, they have you select your screen. There's a few different options here. I always use the VGA 800 by 600. It takes a little bit to load, and then you get your language options and keyboard options. Use Enter. A lot of these screens are using Enter. So it says Start Clonezilla, hit Enter. We want to work with device images, hit Enter. I'd like to apologize the screen's a little bit grainy. I do not have a DVI adapter and I can't use OBS, obviously, because it's in the boot menu. So I had to do the old school screenshot with the camera on the screen and it, you see some of the artifacts from the screen, unfortunately. Once you've selected that you wanna operate off of a local device, that is, you're going to plug a drive into the computer. It goes into a subroutine that looks for drives at that point, you can plug in your drive to see what's different if you're not familiar with what your drives should be. So control C to exit this window, as it says in the prompt. If they're M.2 drives, you'll see them show up because this is a Linux live disk as NVMe, etc. Whereas hard disks will show up as SDA, SDB, SDC. And then I'm going to go down and select SDB1 because that's my target drive. I'm going to skip checking, so I'm just gonna hit enter. You're selecting the folder. Because my target drive has no folders, it's just flat, what you need to do is actually hit tab, and that'll move you over to done and hit enter. Select beginner mode by hitting enter. We're gonna select save disk, not parts, so hit enter again. And we're gonna rename it tab and enter on OK. I know that the boot drive on this computer is the 512, not the two terabyte. So in order to select that, I'm actually going to hit the space bar and then tab and enter on OK. We do want to zip in parallel, so hit enter. I normally skip checking, repairing the source file system, so just hit enter. Yes, check the saved image, hit enter. I don't normally encrypt my images, although you could if it makes a difference to you. So hit enter here. Uh, depending on the situation, often I'll select choose. And in this case, I did to make sure that it completed properly. However, if I'm doing a weekly backup, I'll just have it power off and I'll check it later. So select the option that you want and then hit enter for OK. Hit enter. It puts together the command for it and asks you one last time, are you sure you want to do it? You want to type in the letter Y and hit enter. And that launches the cloning process and it starts going. It clones per partition. And on a boot drive, you have some small partitions. So you'll see it looks like it goes super fast and then it'll get stuck on one that's very, very long. That's the bulk of the drive after it's done those small, tiny little boot related partitions.
Several hours later. Hit enter to continue, and then I'm going to select power off and OK to shut down this laptop. I really hope this was useful to you, and someday it turns a disaster into an annoyance. The other thing, do -do -do -do, do -do 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 -do. the function of flash, flash drives. <laughs> flash R is a large, noisy. Okay. I keep a USB. <clears throat> Really drive. I should unplug that sucker. Let's get these. Here we go. Some bioses, bioses, bios. Some bioses. We're going with that.